he just hand off a torch real nicely. Uh, you want to go first? <laughs> All right. There was one thing that uh, that uh, Chrissy and I were doing um, Friday morning. We got up and we knew we were going to be teaching a lesson this week. Uh, I, I say teaching a lesson. We're in a we're in a class that has young parents, and uh, so we knew this lesson was about marriage, and uh, we were kind of excited to, to, to get together and look at the lesson and what it said and what, what we could get out of it. And sometimes we don't always have that time of uh, being so busy and things, but there were some things that we got that I'm going to share, and then she's going to share what she did. But there's one thing that, that Terry did with the men uh, that night as the men separated from the, from the women, and he talked about this triangle that God at the top, and when uh, the man and the woman is the bottom corners of this triangle. As they get closer together, they get closer to God. And during uh, many times, I've heard Joey and Connie's uh, testimony about their about their marriage and how it was apart. And, and whenever they got saved, that's when it came together. And there were some things that I wanted to just share with you in uh, if Genesis two and twenty four. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think people struggle with, married couples, is leaving and cleaving. And leaving and cleaving means that you leave home. Uh, I've taught my, my, my boys that if they don't have enough money to buy a ring... To, to, to give to a young lady, it's not time to ask her. And uh, I know, so now, they might not have enough money yet since they ain't asking anybody yet. But uh, but we're praying that whenever it comes, comes time, the leaving and cleaving part would be very easy for them. But leaving and cleaving is a lifelong commitment. Uh, I got to, uh, I, I had read these vows before, and Joey had a copy, and it says, uh, you know, in our marriage vows, we say these things, it says, to my wedded husband, I have to have and to hold from this day forward, uh, for richer, for poorer, for better or worse. Now, those are two things, right? But they're supposed to be one thing. It does not matter if it's richer for poor, it should be for both. So some people, if you're not leaving and cleaving in the right way, you're going to pick one or the other. And then it says, uh, from this day forward, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, to cleave unto thee and to thee only as long as we both shall live. So leaving and cleaving is a lifelong commitment. And what happens is if you don't leave and cleave when you're supposed to, your children won't. Because the example that you set that you're not together, you're not one, and these vows that we take... Or we're saying that we're becoming one. And that's one thing that I, I didn't do. I, I was kind of off to my doing my thing. Christy done her thing for, for a long time. And we never grew as one. And if I could just, just be able to share that with somebody that's, that's new, leave and cleave don't mean just getting out of the house. It means becoming one. And when you become one, when your children leave, you have no problem in staying that one. Because sometimes what happens is when your children leave, you don't even know each other. Because you went with this child, and your husband went with this child, and uh, uh, the, the wife went with this child, the husband went with this child, and you were pulled in two separate ways, and you really don't even know each other. I've heard people say that before. So that's not becoming one. That's becoming just a part of a marriage that, that you're just existing. And you know what? If you were getting closer to God, you'd be drawn closer to yourself. That's where I see the difference was when Joey and Connie were separated in that, in that part of, of saying, hey, we're done. God showed up. And I believe that happened in a lot of our marriages. When God showed up, it got sweeter. And we really became one, and we've seen the, the effects of becoming one. So leaving and cleaving really has a different meaning for me today because when my boys leave the house, I want to date my wife just like I always have. I don't want it to be so, well, the kids are gone. Now we can really be married and we can enjoy ourselves. We should be doing it now because we're one. 
So that's what I want to share. Okay, we were really hoping we would go last. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. He said, no, you're going to go first. <laughs> Um, the marriage retreat is uh, special to us because um, we have Adam working full time and then he's in ministry. A lot of times it's hard for us to just be able to sit down and just be able to, um, I'm not going to say talk because I think um, talking is overrated. I think you need to communicate um, because you can say one thing and the other person not understand where you're at. So you need to make sure that you are communicating with each other um, and you don't get off track, that you don't get off kilter. So whenever we get to do that, you know, at home too, but it's just, it's just nice to get away and to be able just to go, okay, <laughs> let's just enjoy this moment. Um, and like Adam said, we're in a new classroom, um, and <laughs> y'all pray for us. <laughs> we're doing we're we're doing good, but we've been serving in different areas, and whenever you're used to serving in different areas, sometimes it's hard to serve together. Just because you're used to going in and you're used to taking control and, and doing your thing, and he is too. So it's it's neat that we're being able to do this, and I know it was a God thing, even though that was probably one of the hardest things that um, I've had to do yet. Um, make it sound, love those girls, and they know it. Um but I know that God has greater plans for us because it is to be able to serve together. Um, that's what we're supposed to do is, is serve together, not apart. So God was saying, okay, y'all have been, been growing on your own. Now you've got to grow together. Um, use what I've, I've shown you for each other. Um, but we did. We got to go over our lesson, and it was it was really cool because we had um, four pictures. And I don't know if you guys had those pictures in your books. Did y'all have those pictures? Okay, thank you. <laughs> y'all could answer that. That was fine. <laughs> but it was neat because I got to share with Adam. It, it asked you to pick one picture that you thought represented marriage. Well, it was a picture of a white wedding dress wedding rings, a uh, church, and then the, um, you need a candle, thank you, and um, I couldn't pick one, because to me, it takes all four of them. Um, you think about the, the wedding dress, and it's white, so it's talking about being pure before the marriage, but it doesn't stop there. That is where you start because you take that purity into your marriage and you keep it there. It's where you're continually cleansed by Christ. And this is precious. And you don't want anything to get in there. Whether it be physically, emotionally, or spiritually. You have to make sure that you stay on guard and that you keep that, that sanctity there in all areas. It's not just before that day. It continues on. And then you went to the, the wedding rings, and that's an outward sign of the commitment that you have for each other, the vows that you take. And I'm a word person. I love looking at words because if you just read them and you don't know what they mean, then it doesn't mean anything to you while you're reading Scripture. So I looked at vow, and the synonyms for them is an oath, a pledge, a bond, a promise, a covenant where I bind myself. So every time I look at my wedding ring, I'm reminded of how faithful God is, of how I made a pledge not only before God but to this man. So I can't let anything, going back to the dress, come in and defile what he's given me. And it's a sign to everyone else that this is not just something I wear. 
this is what God has blessed me with. And then you go to the church. Whenever you've, you've done these, then marriage is supposed to be a picture of Christ. So whenever I take that, I use what God has given me, and I use it for God's glory. And I show how God has worked in our lives, and we're vulnerable. And I'm, I'm a very truthful person. Um, if you ask me something, I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to hide anything. I, I just can't. <laughs> there's not any use in hiding anything because there's somebody out there that's been where you're at and they need to know what happened after this. You know, what did God do? How, how did you just let go? How did you, how did you do that? And the churchy thing is to say, Christ, <laughs> how do you do that? Well, you trust And you have to say, okay, this is what I did this day. I trusted. And I did it all that day. And then I went to sleep. And then I got up that morning and I said, okay, today's a new day. I've got to trust. And I've got to do it all day. And, I, and you just use that to glorify God. Because, and I wrote this down. We are to be faithful to the work of the kingdom. Marriage is an example of how Christ loves us. We should use it to glorify him. And in everything that I do, I've got to glorify God. Well, I have him, so this should be where I glorify him first. And then I can take it and I can be useful for the kingdom. And then you have the the unity candle. And in our, our wedding... We had um, It Takes Three, and I, I love that song, but it has so much more meaning now. And in the picture, you've got the two small candles and the big one in the middle, and you can't see the two small ones. All you see is the light of the big one. I've got to make sure that we are surrounded by Christ, that he is at the center, and that his light shines greater than my light. And Adam has to make sure that his light shines greater than Adam's light. And whenever we do that, then it's just cool how God works. He used, I can't see any four of those pictures. I would choose just one because it takes all of them. And I got to share that with him. And how cool it is. To be able to share those things. And he's excited. He's excited that God is speaking to me. And I'm excited that he sees that as valuable. The marriage retreat is just, is a plus but it gave us the opportunity to slow down and to thank God that he is faithful. So thank you. Hey, I'm Candy Moody. Um, I'm going to have to do this first because my nerves is like really going. <laughs> and um, I'm probably going to geek this up, but if I embarrass myself, he's probably going to do it for me. <laughs> but, um, and it didn't help anything because I said, Steve, I'm so nervous about doing this. He says, I'm nervous for you. I could cry for you. So that really don't help anything. <laughs> so um, um, our wife is kind of like Christie's and Adams. Um, he, um, he works a full-time job and he does ministry. So, we don't, and uh, me being involved with the kids' life, I, we're constantly going, and sometimes we don't get to see each other, but, um, and it's brief sometimes, and sometimes we bicker and all that, but uh, I'm going to start with this verse right here. It's Matthew um, 19, 6. So, then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So, every day we have, like, obstacles of the world, like, trying to come against us, but we always put God first, and he works all those out. And just like Monday and Tuesday, we didn't know if we was going to be able to go on this trip because we got, we got one that got really sick on us, and then it started going like in a pattern. 
but we just trusted God, and then we was able to go, and then, um, I'm so nervous, <laughs> but um, we was able to go, and um, it allowed us to spend a lot of time together, and we never hardly get that, just let us slow down and relax, and we didn't have, and usually when we go, we um, have a set thing of what we're going to do this time, this day, or whatever, but this time we just took it slow, and we really didn't do nothing, <laughs> but hung out, and we played with food, apparently, on the games, <laughs> so, but um, I'm glad I get to do life with you, and I wouldn't choose nobody else but you. <laughs> Apparently, a man can't separate it, but a woman does a fine job. <laughs> I'm going to share what, what I share, what I shared at the marriage retreat and what I share with every man that, that helps in the high school ministry uh, because I got to see some of it come to fruition this year. And it's in Ephesians 5, and, and a lot of you know it. In Ephesians 5:22. Or 525, and I'll, and I'll read. Uh, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And I remember a few years ago, uh, just just studying. I was studying Ephesians, and I and I come across it, and I remember reading that, and and I remember I remember the Lord just telling me that that that's not what you're doing. You know, I know you're doing a lot of things. You're in ministry. You're leading students to Jesus. You're leading the people to, to Christ on outreach. You're involved in everything. You're doing all these things, but you're not, you're not loving your wife like my son loves my church. And I remember we came, it was a Saturday evening, and I didn't know how to do that. I, didn't, I was doing everything that I knew to do, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I remember it was a Saturday evening, and we come into church on Sunday morning. We sit over there, and I cried through two services. And she just held my hand. She didn't know why I was crying. She just looked at me and smiled. And, and, and she didn't have no clue what was going on. Every 10 minutes she'd go, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? You know, but and, and, and truth be known, I didn't really understand what was, because I didn't, I knew that this isn't what I was doing, but I didn't know how to do that. And then, and then it, it just clicked one day. When we first started in ministry, I put so many pressures on my wife of what I thought she should be, of, of what I thought she should do, and, and, and what I had seen uh, just the little while I've been in church. And it was just, it was just, it was too much. And I remember, I read on, I don't remember where it is, but I read where it says that Christ adorns the church. It lines up with this. It says where Christ is what makes the church blameless and holy. And I remember thinking that that's my responsibility. That it never matters what she does. It never matters the ideas that I have in my mind of who she's supposed to be and what I think she's supposed to do. But I'm supposed to do whatever I can to present her to a holy God as a beautiful bride. And I remember when that clicked, we got to go on this marriage retreat and she just got to be herself. And it's probably the best two days we've had since we've been married. And it was all because of what the Lord is doing. It has nothing to do with anything that I figured out or me knowing anything. It's all got to do with what the Lord does in somebody's life. And I, if, I have, if I ever have, this scripture here has changed my marriage. It's changed how I view things. It's changed how I do ministry. And if I ever have any advice for any man, young or old, the students hear it all the time, the guys, if I ever have any advice for them, it always starts right here in who they are and leading their family. And, and, and this, this trip, this marriage retreat has been such a blessing for me because for so, I did a lot of things 
And I was so not who I was supposed to be before I come to New Christ. And it took years after I was saved of him working and for me to get this. But the joy that I have for being able to go on this trip and to treat my bride like a bride and it not be about ministry and not be about what we're doing and not be about what's going on. It was the most enjoyable two days we've ever had. And I thank this church, I thank Brother Joey and Miss Connie for, for doing things like this because they get it. And uh, thanks to their obedience and doing it others, they get it too. I'm really nervous, but I don't think I'm breaking out in hives or nothing yet, but we'll get started. Um, on the way here, I looked at Mickey, and I said, so what? She said, well, you're the man. You're the leader. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but to start with that, for uh, almost 12 years of our marriage, I was not. I was lost, and I was just lost. You know, I did, we, we married at... Uh, in 94, I was 20 and she was 19. Uh, that's what we thought we were supposed to do, you know. So, And it was, but as we got to growing older together, uh, she got to walking in the Lord more. And and I was like, what is that? You know, I, I never knew that. So as, as she was getting more involved. With well, the beginning, I think I was dragging her down. You know, I was pulling her away from her walk. And so the, the more I, I see her getting involved, and I'm like, you know, what's going on here? And uh, it was hard. <laughs> but a few weeks ago, we went to a, class, a discipleship class, and the guy, the guy said, I, he was talking about who discipled you, who discipled you. And he said, when, it, when it's... Uh, when I say that, I want you to say the name out loud. And when he said it, I said, Mickey, my wife. You know, and as Joey mentioned the other night, you know, we're supposed to be discipling our wives, but I didn't know what to disciple because I didn't know Jesus. But as that, as that rode on, you know, I kept, I kept seeing her and seeing her getting involved and her praying. And that's one thing that I want to mention to you, know, I want to mention to you young people, that don't be unequally yoked. Know who you're going to marry. You know, know that they know God, you know, and I did not. Just know that. But also, for the ones that spouse comes without the other, you know, I was helpless and hopeless against her prayers. She prayed so hard for me, it's, I can't even say, you know, I was just, it broke me. You know, I come to a place in my life, April 18th, 2006, I got on my knees and I said, I want what she's got. You know, I, I want Jesus in my life. I went through job situations and realized it wasn't job situations. It was wrong. It was Tony what was wrong. I had never given my life to Christ. But from that point on, uh, like I said, she's a big part. But something that really that I wanted to read is, <coughs> Candy, she read the last part of it. But the Pharisees come in, you know, they're the old Pharisees. And Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read? You know, what did he do when he was tempted in the wilderness? He, he put scripture back at him. Have you not read? He who made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one. And that's what, I, you know, I got. We're one. <laughs> we're to stand strong. We're to tell others, you know, what he done in our lives, you know, for 12 years. It was tough. But I, as I share my testimony, sometimes, you know, I tell people I was a good old boy. <laughs> you know, I would do the dishes. I would, you know, I'd take care of things. I was a good dad, but I was a lost dad. Mm -hmm. But that day, you know, it changed everything. But like I said, the thing that stuck out to us this weekend was one flesh. And so Saturday, we tubed. We thought we were young. <laughs> we felt the pain a little bit later, but we got back to the room Friday, 
and some th- some people had uh, texted us some things that were going on, and we just sat, stayed in our room and prayed. Prayed as a couple, prayed for these families, prayed for us to be closer to God today than we were yesterday, to, to, be, to show that love that he showed for us and to, you know, just to be one. And, that, and that's what we got out of it is to be, to be united, to be one flesh. And, uh, and another thing about it is, is Connie and, and Joey got in, and they shared their story and it's real. You know, so many times, and I've seen it in church, you know, we don't, we don't, need, to, we don't need to put on our church, you know, we got to be real with God. When we're not, <laughs> he lets us know. So, you know, we got to be real and we got to show the love that he showed for us. Um, well, I know several of you are probably be a little bit nervous with me being up here um, with bananas or oranges or little Debbie cakes or anything else I could throw out. But um, Adam really has some talent that we don't know about. He's got some hidden talents. I don't want to say he's a monkey. He's more like probably a gorilla um, due to the size. But he's got some really good talents. Um, but that was a lot of fun to watch people come out of their comfort zone. Candy, I know you were out of your comfort zone then, too. Um, as well. Um, but just like um, Tony said, um, I, you know, I was a preacher's kid. Um, I always sat on second row. It's why we sit in the back now. But um, anyways, the mom would reach over and pinch me, you know, if anything ever started going wrong. But I was a church girl. And so, um, but I didn't know I was marrying unequally yoked. You know, I grew up in the church where usually the men sit on one side and the women sit on the other side. It wasn't the, the husband and wife sitting together typically. Um, it's what you saw, you know, back um, in those those years of coming up. And so we had the prayer bench. We had the unity candle. We had all of that at our wedding. Um, and everything was fine. And Tony came to church. Um, he actually probably saved our lives um, on March 27th of 1990 because he didn't come to Sunday school when he come in and told us, told my daddy, hey, there's bad storms coming, and I think you need to dismiss church. And daddy did, and that was the Palm Sunday tornadoes. Um, But there was a time in 2006, we were in revival, and a brother, my brother that's just seven years older than me, who was very close to Tony and I, accepted his call to the ministry that night during revival without his wife being there. And... Something happened to Tony that night, and Tony wouldn't go back with me. So, you know, um, I don't know. You know, there are a lot of things happened. We had a kid. I thought, this will bring him to church. No, I didn't bring him to church. It's just me and the kid. Had another kid. I thought, this will bring him to church. No, it's me and two kids now. And then God really began to work on me, and I had to um, leave my daddy's church, leaving and cleaving. And I had to become a big girl and realize that I had been playing church for so long. And y'all saw me go through the waters of baptism not too long ago. And that was partly because around this time when I really began a relationship with the Lord. And then I began to realize, and I shared this in Sunday school this morning. Isn't it funny how our Sunday school lesson was on marriage today? I mean, did y'all look at the calendar when y'all planned this, that Sunday school was going to be on marriage, you know, from that? It's God, isn't it? But our Sunday school lesson was on marriage. And I shared that this morning, um, as Todd was saying, maybe we look at our spouse and think they need to change. You know, and I did. I thought, man, Tony needs to change. He needs to get right. He needs to quit this hunting mess and, I, you know, all his little hunting buddies. He got to, up to where he would just leave on Sunday mornings before I got out of the bed and go hunting so we wouldn't have a fight um, for church. And I didn't like his hunting, his hunting friends either, you know, so because they were taking Tony. But as I began to um, go deeper and I, I joined a, a lady's Sunday school class, and I had a lady who mentored and poured into me, and she had children that was my age, and she had been coming to church and had been unequally yoked for 40-something years. She taught me what it was to love my unsaved husband, how to respect my unsaved husband, and also how to let him still kind of to lead the household. So as that began to change, I realized that Mickey was the one that had to do a lot of changing. It wasn't just Tony. The Lord changed me in so many ways because I am very headstrong. Um, if anybody ever has conversations with me, if I am passionate and determined about something, you're not going to persuade me otherwise. 
And he changed me in a lot of ways and showed me how I had to start being submissive to Tony in certain areas of our lives. And so I began to pray, and I had so many people praying for him. And I remember even that was back when I laid in the tanning bed for hours at a time, and now my skin looks horrible from it. But I would even lay there for 30 minutes at a time praying for Tony, that every corner he turned, that somebody would be there. And, Father, if it meant him changing jobs, let him change jobs, because there was not a believer at his, the place he worked and had worked for years. So during that time, I began to see God work. But guess who changed jobs first? Me. And guess who came home around Christmas of 2005 and said, they're moving the plant to Albertville. And I was like, uh-oh, what are we going to do now? And the lady that had taught me all this said, Mickey, you've asked for it, so you've got to weather the storm and you've got to go forward with it. So we did, and then went through some different things. And Tony <clears throat> and Bailey at the same night in our home except to Christ um, in 2006. But, you know, that's just really where our story begins. In marriage, you go through so, so many different seasons and different changes in life. And um, we've been through a lot of seasons since Tony's become a believer, and that's all part of God's plan. Um, in 2010, on May 8th, I lost my, my mama, and my mama was so precious to me. I was a mama's baby. I'd still sleep with her right now if I could. Um, and I took care of my mama, and um, I just, I loved her so much. And she was so um, faithful and, and just always had the joy of the Lord on her face. And I remember driving. I had been to Birmingham that day for work, and I was by myself. And it was sometime, we lost my daddy in November of the same year, so about six months apart. And it just hit me that nobody here on this earth had to love me. My mama was gone. So nobody here had to love me naturally. And I realized then that Tony Kerr chooses to love me every day. And sometimes I'm pretty unlovable. But he chooses to love me. I choose to love him every day. Some days those days are hard, and we have to put on a different attitude towards each other. I would also say to the younger couples um, and the youth, you need to surround yourself with couples of like faith. So if those couples can encourage you and help carry your burdens when you go through the different chapters in life and the different seasons in life, you need those people that can come in and rally behind you. And sometimes they may have to pick you up and literally carry you, depending on what the situation is. But you need those people. But you can't have that group unless you're going to be real with that group. You have to be open and honest about what's going on. If you're not being real, there's not going to be any healing with it. Always make time for each other. Our scripture plainly says that it should be God, our spouse, and then the children. In today's world, and Adam spoke on this um, too, so many times we see people that are around our age start to divorce because they've been so involved in what is going on in their children that they don't even know who the spouse is anymore. Um, if you're that parent and you've got to have your hand in everything, no matter what their age is, stop. I taught a women's class one time, and this girl got sideways with me about it, but you have to stop, and you have to put your husband before your children. It's a commandment. We have to do that. It doesn't make sense a whole lot, and it's kind of hard, but we have to do that because one day the children are going to be gone, and Tony and I are about to be in that situation um, as well. A couple of things about the marriage retreat that I love so much was there was such a variety of age groups and such a variety from newlyweds to, I think, 49 years was the longest we had, two couples that had been married for 49 years. 
Um, and that's just so fantastic. And I love that they placed us with different people at different tables so that we got to learn um, about each other and learn different things that was going on. We made bonds with those people that we'll probably have from here on out. Um, and it's just such a, a special time to know that they, too, at 49 years in, are still investing in their marriage. They're not just, well, we're married, we're going to ride this out. The other thing that, um, and I know that a couple has already mentioned this, but Brother Joey and Connie, y'all just do not know what y'all mean to us. And you being so transparent each and every day, Sunday, Wednesday, every time we see you, and being so real and telling us what you're dealing with and what's going on means so much to me. For me to see little Miss Connie turn around and pull her husband up so they can go to the altar, if you've not been in another church, you don't know what that means to see that happen. It means so much. And I just want to thank you for your example that you set for us. And um, and I believe Tony would agree, but our marriage is stronger since we've came to U3B, uh, um, and it has changed. So a couple things I want to leave you with. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying for your unbelieving spouse, whether it's male or female. Don't stop praying. Have the faith, male. Have the faith. The Lord will capture their heart. And he will. He will. Have that faith. Also, um, <clears throat> make it important to have those date nights and to treat each other with respect. You know, I tell my children when they walk out of the house, you're not going out like that because you are representing me when you go out. So, Look at, you know, would you do that in front of, the, in public? Well, why would you do it to a you wife? I'm not going to go into any details about that kind of stuff. But, you know, just kind of those kind of things. You know, treat her as a queen and treat him as a king, as it should be. And then I'm also going to read some scriptures. Um, and this is our, and also uh, I meant to tell you our pickup line. I picked him up. Lively's parking lot, July 27th, 1994. 1990, and 10 years later, I had his second child on that same day. I was like, whoo, where'd this go wrong? But anyways, so um, never thought that would happen just from Lively's parking lot. Okay, so this is our scriptures um, as well, and this is Ecclesiastes um, it's 5, excuse me, 4, 9 through 12. Um, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for if he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though they may be overpowered by another, two, with can, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's Christ, Tony, and Mickey, the threefold cord. So um, if Tony and I can ever be a help of anybody, if anybody's dealing with some of the things we've dealt with in our marriage, um, by no means do we have it right. We don't. We're still on a journey, and every day's a new day. But we will be glad to um, talk and pray with you. Hello, I'm Leif Mooring, and this is my husband, Todd. I want to say thanks to all the couples that went on the marriage retreat. Um, it gets bigger and bigger every year. This year's it's the biggest. We were concerned on how we were going to get all y'all in that room. We kept rearranging and figuring out and taking down walls, but we got everybody in. And um, we just love for everybody to come back next year. It's always the same time, the uh, weekend before Valentine's. And uh, hopefully we'll have more people. We've already figured out how we can get more people in there. This year, um, we had so many ages. It was great because we had, like Mickey said, you know, couples that were almost going to be married 50 years and then some that weren't even married a year. And um, we're kind of right in the middle. So we were able to 
see both sides of it, and, and that's what's wonderful. It's encouraging. Um, on one of the nights, we separate, and the ladies go in one room, and the men go in the other. Um, and you might think, oh, my goodness, you know, what's somebody going to say? He better not say anything about me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is because we've got because we've got all those ages, it's an encouragement. Um, you know, you may think um, marriage is a fairy tale, or you look at somebody and you think they've got the best marriage. Why can't my marriage be like their marriage? And um, what happens is, you know, the ladies, they talk, and what everybody kept coming back to was having God in the center of their marriage. Um, we've all got struggles, but we've got to remember to keep God right in the center. Um, it's the same thing in our lives. If we take our eyes off God, that's when Satan creeps in, and it's in our marriage. Um, when we don't keep him in the center of our marriage, things just go south, and before you know it, you don't really know what happens, and they can be small things or big things. Um, I've got... Mickey took part of my verse. <laughs> I just got the little part. <laughs> um, i got to put my glasses on, too. Ecclesiastes 4.12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a quarter of three strands, strands will not quickly broken. Um, I can't do it by myself. And Todd and I can try. But without God helping us both, we won't be strong enough. Um, we won't be able to, to fight our battles together. And so that's, it's something, it's encouraging to hear um, from all the couples to be around them at the marriage retreat because you realize that life's life and none of us are perfect. But it's, it's, it's fun to laugh at everybody. It's fun to laugh at, at the problems we may have. But it's also very encouraging, and uh, we love our church family. Um, you talk about sometimes friends are better than family, and that's kind of what we think about some of the friends that we have here at this church. Um, we love spending a couple of days with y'all, and I hope that, um, that y'all enjoyed it too, and we would love for it to grow bigger and bigger, and we'll just have to figure it out. Thanks. Uh I'll try my best to get through all this. Uh, I'm a little different. I don't hear any amens. Uh, <laughs> God speaks to me through through life. Uh, I, I see things and, and objects and people. And, and, and this weekend, summed up, if I had to sum it up in, in, in three things, it would be a, a deer head, snapshots, and fallen rocks. And I know you're going, what in the world? Where are we going? A deer head. We were on our way out of town on Saturday, and we decided that we would stop in a few antique shops and kind of goof off on the way home. We went in one antique shop, and uh, we were with the Thackers, and, and there was a deer head mounted. And Isaac made the comment. He said, when I see a deer head, somebody thought enough of that to have it mounted. They treasured it enough to have it mounted. But there's a story that goes along with that deer head. Who were the guy's friends with him? What was the circumstances around that? You know, what happened that day? There's a story behind that deer mount. Which brings me to snapshots. We, we all took a, a lot of selfies and photos this weekend. Uh, and I call them snapshots because that's what it is. It's a moment in time that we take a snapshot of. But that one snapshot doesn't tell you what led up to that snapshot or what happened after that snapshot. I can tell you we went hiking. We took some selfies of us smiling, but there wasn't a whole lot of smiling before and after. <laughs> you know, it didn't, it didn't show you the 2.3 miles of the beautiful streams and, and, and up to the waterfall. We took the selfies and the smiling faces and then, ooh, rocks and streams and roots and inclines and declines. You couldn't tell any of that about that snapshot. And that's what 
this marriage retreat was about. There are a lot of people with a lot of stories. And that comes to fallen rocks. There was a sign, I don't know if any of you saw it, leaving, going toward uh, Pigeon Forge that said fallen rocks. It didn't say falling rocks. It said fallen rocks. Now, there is no other foundation that anyone can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But we have earthly rocks that we look to. Joey and Connie are our examples. There are other couples that are our examples. But We have to understand that even as a godly couple, there are mistakes made. No one is perfect. There are fallen rocks, and it's the state of our world. We need to keep that in our minds. There are no perfect marriages. There are struggles, and everybody suffers from them. Joey said a few times, We made a joke. I think Jake Ford said they had an argument on the way up there. It's always a joke about who got in a fight or an argument on the way up there. But Joey made a comment, don't you have an argument on the way home? Well, guess what? (laughs) Now, it wasn't really an argument, but we decided, like I said, we stopped a few antique stores on the way out. And we decided we're going to be spontaneous for once, you know, and not be in a rush to go home. But... um, we stopped a couple of stores, we ate, and we decided as we go, we're going to stop at a few more antique stores. Where it's, it's 3.30 Eastern time. We don't have a plan. Google's not helping. So here we go down the interstate, and I said, well, where's the nearest one? Well, it's .2 miles. Well, honey, I'm in the left lane. I can't get over that quick. She's huff, huff. Look, <laughs> about the fourth one, the phone goes in the floor. And I hear the song, even though the radio's playing, Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. It was the, she saturated me with silence. But I remember Joey said, I'm not pinning this on you, brother. (laughs) A lot of times, and you've been there, honey, where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? I don't care. (laughs) It don't matter. Well, we'll go here. Well, no, I ate there yesterday. (laughs) So I thought, this is not a big deal, okay? We'll deal with this. I said, honey, if you're going to soul up, you're going to miss a beautiful ride home. I probably shouldn't have said that, (laughs) but it was the truth. I was trying to be honest and positive. It was going to be okay. The expectations of having a spontaneous day had been crushed, and we weren't happy about it. So the silence rolled all the way up to my doorstep at home. (laughs) Unpacking the vehicle, taking the clothes downstairs, and I'm I'm trying to help out. Not trying to suck up, just trying to help out because I know there's a lot of clothes that need to be washed. I'm going to do the right thing regardless. And in my mind, it's like, I love you, honey, and ain't a darn thing you can do about it. (laughs) This morning, there's still tension. And... And Joey says, hey, buddy, uh, what do you think about getting up and speaking about what you got out of the marriage retreat? (laughs) I I laughed. (laughs) I left his office and went and did some things. I said, "Uh, I, I cannot, A, teach a lesson on marriage without my marriage being right. So I said, I've, I've got to 
find her, and we got to get this cleared up before I can talk to anybody else about this lesson. I'm done. I was done being a hypocrite when I got saved. That was it. I'm not going to be one. Then I went back in and I told Joey, I said, I just, listen, I, I appreciate your, you know, asking me to do it, but I don't think today would be the day to do that for me. I said, uh, we had a little issue on the way home and uh, it went against everything that we talked about. And he just kind of laughed. He said, give it to this afternoon. And I thought, okay. Well, guess what? I'm here. We're good. And, uh, you know, in the midst of that, I came away with this. Um, pray for your children and for yourself that you find someone that puts you second. As long as Christ is first, everything else will fall into place. I know where her heart is. It was just temporary walking in the flesh and still the spirit, and we all do it. I probably contributed some of it, so I can't. <laughs> but what I'm saying is those are the only secure things that we have. Christ Jesus. And if you and your spouse have Christ first, everything else will work out. Uh, she knows I love her. Uh, I know she loves me. And uh, I, it was just a moment. All of your examples and your leaders are fallen rocks that you look up to. Have realistic expectations. And when those expectations are not met, look to Jesus Christ. Uh, when I think about you, Todd, right now, I'm thinking about the deer mount. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story behind it. <laughs> There's a story behind the huff, too. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. <laughs> okay. Um, I, guess, I guess for me, um, you know, every year we share our testimony, and I was standing up here, I was listening to the little pieces of everybody's, and, um, you know, and I kept thinking, you know, God, you have worked so much in our marriage over the last 35 years. But w since we've been saved, I don't think we've had a more challenging year than this year up to this point. From January of last year, well, May of last year till this point. And, um, and I loved what you said, Leith. Um, we're not strong enough to do it by ourselves. And so many times we separate, and I try to be strong, and he tries to be strong, and we're not strong enough to do it ourselves. We're not. And um, my life verses, um, you know, I said this is funny because I'm horrible at memorizing, and I'm just going to call you out, Barry. Um, call me out, probably. But the day that you, I do horrible when I'm called out, and I hate that about myself because I want to no scripture, just like that. And so I'm horrible at that. I know his, his life verse better than I know my own. But mine's four verses. And I'm like, Lord, why did you give me four verses? Why not just, you know, uh, Proverbs 37, 5, uh, trust in the Lord and he will act. Can you just give me that one? But he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. Um, so, um, but I've never thought about my verses for my marriage. It, you know, I've always thought about it for my walk with Christ, but it's Philippians 2, 1 through 4, and it says, if you have any encourage, encouragement um, from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, 
having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And, you know, I got to thinking about this year. And when I say this year, I'm, I'm going from May forward. And, and let me just say, I'm so thankful for some of the um, men in here. I know some of you are in here that have invested and are still investing in my son. In June, he made a decision to follow Christ. And I just want you to know that I'm so thankful for you. And you think that doesn't have anything to do with our marriage, but it does. You know, we want our children. Let me take a deep breath. We want our children's marriages. Our, our prayer was that our children's marriage would be as strong as our marriage. And sometimes our plan is, you know, is not their plan. It, not saying it's not God's plan, but, you know, we can't control um, how our children handle their marriage. Um, so this year... Um, you know, I was just thinking uh, when Brandon came, and, and maybe he won't be upset with me. I'm not going to share a whole lot, but um, when he came and spoke to us, I was so broken over that. I was so broken. But over the past six months, I have reminded him over and over and over, as he said over and over and over, Mom, I'm so sorry. I've disappointed you. I'm so sorry that this has happened. I'm so sorry that I wasn't a good husband. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I've reminded him that, you know what, God hates divorce, but he loves you so much. So if you've gone through a divorce, he loves you so much. He does. Um, and then, you know, we've had conversations after conversations, and through those, conversa those conversations, I found myself clinging more to my husband than I do. I just found myself constantly reaching out for him and wanting him closer to me and, you know, and to share with him the things that God's showing me, to share with him because there's so many times we talked about being holy and for us to be holy, we have to have a spiritual intimacy with each other also. We can't just have our own relationship and not bring it into this relationship. Um, so we have talked so much in the past nine months, um, just spiritual things and, you know, how do, we, how do we help our children? How do we, you know, and of course, when you have one that struggles, then you find yourself really focusing. You know, I have, we have our two grandbabies and, you know, Jessica called me, Mom, you know, Josh has got to work in Huntsville. Do you think, yes, absolutely, bring them to me. It's okay, because I want you to have that time. I find myself just really reminding myself that maybe I didn't pour into my children's marriage as much. Um, leave and cleave, you know, you, we ha and I shared this with the moms, that, or the wives, the moms, that, you know, we have to let them leave and cleave. I don't care how much you love your children, and I understand, we have to let them leave and cleave because they can't, make it otherwise they have to leave and cling to each other and then cleave to the Lord and then um, uh, uh, just w watching you two the last few years and just how far you've come and how much God has grown you candy from the time you've left the ladies class and all the struggles and ministry and oh my goodness I'm just so proud of you two and what God's doing in your marriage and your family. And, you know, God has a, has a perfect plan. And so as I'm, I'm thinking about everybody that was there, and, and you, you can't help but think of those that didn't make it. You're going to think of those because you want everybody's marriage to be so strong. But then I was thinking about our own marriage, and I was thinking about how good God has been to us. And I was thinking about the trial that we're going through now, and I'm just thinking... I'm just thinking about, you know, I know you said I'm your rock, but he is such a strong leader for me. He is, he is that one that, you know, when I'm coming apart, they says, honey, stand up. Let's go. And I know he prays for me each and every day. 
And without that, our marriage can't make it. We cannot, we are not strong enough by ourselves. We are not. And I think what hit me the most with what marriage truly is, is we were, we um, had left the doctor's office. And I haven't shared it with him, but we left the doctor's office. And after the doctor, you know, you sit there in silence. You don't really know what to say. You're just trying to take it in. And I knew before we left what our decision was. And that was not to make a decision right now. And we got in the car and I told him, I, and I just, I think I was just very bold about, we are not doing anything right now. We're not doing anything because, you know, we're not doing anything because we don't know what God's plan is and we're not going to act out of panic. And this is what I want you to do. And then I thought about what I said. And I said, well, honey, it's your body. you got to make that decision. I can't make that decision. And he looked at me and he said, well, the last time I checked, we were one. And that just struck me in such a way to think, you're right. We are one. And he can't go through this without me telling him what to do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that'll dry them up. <laughs> <laughs> but, no. <laughs> but, you know, we are one. We are one. And this year, God has done such a work. We, we are not perfect. We don't have, we have our, and, and that's where the, and I'll just share that. Um, we, had a, we had a little, uh, we had a little, just a little spat about a mattress that's in the camper and it's a thick mattress it's a thick mattress and and I told him I said now before we sell that camper I want that mattress I want to bring that one in and swap it with the thin mattress and put this one on that spare bed and he said honey that mattress is not going to fit and I said yes it is I want you to just bring. he said do you want me to get a measuring tape and measure it I said no I want you to bring the mattress in, put it on that bed, because the mattress is going to fit that bed. And he said, honey, the mattress is not going to fit. And I was like, okay. And I just got quiet. Well, he went and measured it, and the mattress don't fit. <laughs> so a few weeks earlier, um, I had read this little thing where they were asking questions, and um, one of the questions is, Ask your mate what it is that you do that frustrates him. So I said, what do I do that frustrates you? It's and a loaded said, question. No. Don't answer it. And he said, when you get frustrated or you get mad, you huff. <sighs> and then you huff some more. <sighs> and I said, I do not huff. And so, so I got, when I got aggravated with that, I huffed. <laughs> And I caught myself huffing, and I said, okay, honey, I huff. But, but in that, in that, the best thing that come from that is that the whole time my son was sitting on the couch, and he saw that little spat, and he said to me on Monday night when we had a two-and-a-half-hour conversation, he said, Mom, that's not how we argued. That's the, you and Dad were over it. You just, he, and I said, well, Son, maybe I was over it on the outside, sometimes on the inside. <laughs> but I said, you know, but our, our children are watching us. They're watching us. And our marriage is not perfect. And I don't want my grandkids, I don't want you to look and say, oh, you know, or at any of us and say, marriage is perfect because you're so right. When the wedding day is over, you have a husband that you promise to spend your life with. And when the wedding day is over, what happens afterwards and what you choose to do with that, that's what matters. That's what matters. Hmm. You know, <clears throat> I'm so proud of uh, all, all of our leaders and so many couples that's in our church. And I know there's so many people in our church and, and, and people we know that are praying for their family and for their marriage and, uh, and we're praying for other people's marriage at the same time. Uh, all I know is we have a big God and he's faithful. 
Amen. Uh, but the one thing that we walked away, Terry, I had asked him to share with the men. And it was kind of funny the way all that worked out, but he did an excellent job. While he's talking, I'm sitting up on stage and listening to our men just respond. And uh, the maturity and the openness of what I was hearing was just amazing. And it just dawned on me <coughs> that um, in John 4, 1, Jesus said that he uh, made and baptized more people than John. And uh, I had remembered reading the word m- baptize, but I didn't remember seeing the word made. And the whole purpose of marriage, I'm supposed to disciple my wife. I'm supposed to love her like Christ loved the church. It's my responsibility. Even though I have a calling to be your pastor, I have a calling to be their granddad and my son and my daughter, their dad. But my greatest calling in the world is to disciple my wife. And and I'm supposed to make disciples in that area. And that's the one thing that we have forgotten. And uh, some men... When uh, we are confronted with needing to grow spiritually, we run. That's what we do. We run. We, we flee to excuses, and then we take it out when we're not where we need to be. When in reality, what we need to understand is, if I have the heart to disciple my wife, I'm not going to have a problem discipling you. Amen? We are closer together than anybody else. She knows me better than anybody. We have our quirks, uh, the huffing, the the puffing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, We have all of these things, and we all have those things. But that doesn't take one, that doesn't rob me of anything of how much I love and cherish her. You know, we've been married 35 years And I wish I could have known what I realized sitting on that stage in Gatlinburg uh, Friday night. It was just a moment for me. That everything I do in my life is so important. And everything that I've seen God do is so important. But there has nothing been more important than the spiritual growth of my wife in the past eight years. I'm so proud of her. And what she's becoming. And uh, it just brags on me. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it, it just shows that, uh, that God just uses both of us together. And I was thinking about that while Leith and Todd is up here. And Adam and Christy and, and, and Mickey and, and Tony. I'm just now getting to know y'all. But uh, I'm just watching God work. And I was thinking this, Leith, when you picked up that microphone. God just told me she's growing. You would have never done that. And not only did you do it, you've done a great job. Yeah, you are really growing so strong spiritually. And uh, that makes you proud to be somebody's pastor. Because I know how hard that is to stand up in front of everybody. Uh, I want to encourage you tonight is... We always do a thing, but, you know, we're going to have the invitation in a minute. And uh, just like Mickey said, don't, don't, never stop praying for your mate. Never stop praying for your children. Never stop praying for those. And, and don't be afraid to pray for the desires of your heart. Don't be afraid to ask God for those things. That's why God gave you those desires. It's so you know how to ask him. You have not because you church we are such a blessed church i'm a blessed man i have the most awesome wife in the world i have a wonderful family and uh god is in complete control of everything since this past year in the past 15 months of my life has been the most amazing 15 months of growth in my life that i've ever experienced in my life from reaching unreached sequoia tribes to to just watching a church and and watching a unity i have never never been in standing in a congregation 
tonight, I have never stood in a congregation with this much unity and this much power in it in my life. I have never experienced that before. What we have right now, at this moment, is the most amazing thing that I have ever experienced in my life. I won't, let's don't take that for granted. In this invitation tonight, I want to encourage you to pray with your husband or pray with your wife or pray and use the altar. Ask God what you need to ask him. And most of all is make sure you're saved. Make sure you know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And make a commitment tonight. And I need to talk to my men for a minute. My men over 50 years of age, this attitude that, that, that of, 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 uh, of pridefulness and arrogance and boastfulness about being men, we need to get over ourselves. We're supposed to disciple the one we love. We're supposed to invest our life in them and pour ourselves spiritually. You know what that tells me? I need to grow stronger spiritually so I can lead her deeper next year, this year. I have to do that. I'm going to do that. Amen? You see, that is what God has called us all to do. We're going to make disciples. And as long as my heart is making disciples, I'm going to love the one I'm with. Amen? <laughs> Somebody had a good idea about a song on that one. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and we're doing life together. And, uh, and, and this, is what I, this is what I shared with, uh, with the guys, this, with all the couples. We have overcome a lot of obstacles in our life that now, since we have another obstacle in it, we don't have all those things that don't matter anymore. Now we're doing it together. We've overcome so many things that really wasn't important. You know, the immaturity, the, the arguing over things we don't need to argue over, the being right, the being wrong. None of those things are important. If we had not grown spiritually to that place, can you imagine what would happen to us when something like this happened, what has happened to us in the past 12 months? Can you imagine what it would have done in our marriage? God never intended for us to be over 50 and be immature spiritually. We've got to do life together now. And we're going to take on all the struggles that growing older brings you. And we're going to do it together. And you know what? We're going to kick tail. <laughs> Amen? We're going to kick tail. So I just want to challenge you as a church. We want to lead as your example. I just want you to know that my example is Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I love you. And God, I thank you so much for um, the amazing stories and testimonies and transparency. God, that... Uh, that, that it's just so real, and watching the growth of so many, God, just thank you so much. Father God, uh, we know that, uh, <clears throat> we know you love Sunday nights, because you've just got a special way of showing up on our Sunday nights. That tells me you love these people in this room. So Father, I just pray that right now you be in this invitation. You speak to us. You unite us. You grow us. Father God, you help us tonight to become stronger as one with you being the strongest link in our marriage. And Father God, we give you the glory for it all. Without you, we don't have anything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, I'm the pastor of Union 3. My name is Joey Hanner and... Uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to listen to the message today. But I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And today, when we think about salvation, uh, I was one of those church members, one of those people that said I prayed when I was younger, and, uh, but my life did not change. When, we, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will change. God has a plan for your life. You see, He created you for heaven. 
but you can't earn or deserve that because heaven is a perfect place and God says I'm not going to let one sin into heaven the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and when we think about sin we think about murder we think about stealing but the sin is what we think is, is our thought life and we are just sinful by nature and Jesus came where it doesn't have to be that way. God loves us. He said, I'll solve that problem. I'm going to send my son, Jesus. He sent his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. You see, God came to give you life. And he wants us to be more than a church member. He wants us to be more than someone that prayed a prayer, said a decision. Praying a prayer is the greatest power there is because that is our tool and the instrument God give us to repent. He said, if you'll repent, he said, times of refreshing will come in your life. You see, in our life, God looks at us, but he can't see, he can see us. We can't have a relationship with him because this sin separates us from God. When we take and we have intellectual, we know that God exists we have intellectual faith but we just believe that he's there but we don't really have a relationship with him uh, we have temporal faith temporal faith is well, god i tell you what if you'll fix this in my life i'll turn my life around well where does my sin go it doesn't go anywhere well god i tell you what if you'll do this in my life i promise you i'll turn over a new leaf It'll go for a little while, and then it just will go right back into the same old, same old. Why? Because we think we can change ourselves. Friend, you can't change yourself. If you could, you would have already done it. Only thing that can change your life is by God's grace. He came into this world so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's why the scripture says, all like sheep have gone astray, each into his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he takes his sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And there's one mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that. It also teaches in first or in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So can you go to a time in your life? that you trusted Jesus. If you never have, you can do it by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior. I am trusting you today to save me. And you will be my Lord and be my Savior. If you've done that today, we're proud of you. And we'd love to hear from you here at Union 3. Go to u3bchurch.com. Or just call the church office and let someone know, 256-494-9180. We would love to hear from you. And thank you again for watching here at Union 3 Baptist Church. We love you, and we have a great big old life.